Okay, I've already done an introduction to Gettysburg High Tide of the Confederacy, so I won't repeat the information there. But um, I thought it might be fun to do a playthrough of the game, at least the first day's battle, since I had done a playthrough of Gettysburg 77, the intermediate level, the first day of the battle. I thought it might be fun to compare the two. So I'm not going to try to explain the rules. I'll just shoot the video, stopping, pausing after each Union and Confederate move, and we'll take it from there. I won't be explaining all the rules, but I'll explain some things as we go along. So let's start the game, which starts 7 o'clock in the morning, July 1st, with the Confederates coming on the board. Okay, that's the setup for the game, but the Devon and Gamble have quite a, a lot of leeway in where they can set up. They set up anywhere between the Hagerstown Road and the Mumensburg Road, um, at least 10 hexes away from the entry hex. I've chosen this one because I'm going to try the historical um, tactic that Devon and Gamble utilize, that is to slow down Heath as much as possible. Of course, we have a lot more knowledge about what occurred than they could have known, so all Gettysburg games suffer from that. But I'll try to play historical in that I'm going to try to gain every inch of time I can without threatening or, or losing Devon and Gamble. So Heath and... Um, or rather, uh, Dev, uh, Davis and Archer of Heath's division come on the Chambersburg Pike, but they're allowed this entry area A. They could come out in line, but I'm going to try to play equally aggressive as the Confederates and come in as far as I can on in column and convert to line. So we'll follow the action after the Confederates have moved. Okay, the two Confederate brigades came on the board in column, but they converted to line. So Davis and Archer are in line here along the Chambersburg foot pike. So Devon and Gamble will react to that. I'll look at their possibilities and uh, we'll try to see how they can gain every inch of space if they can. Okay, Devon and Gamble only fell back about one hex. They want to try to gain every inch of space they can. I think they're fairly safe there. So that's the end of this 7 a.m. turn. And we'll go to a closer view for the uh, next moves. Okay, we're doing the 8 o'clock turn. More units of the Confederacy come on the board. Two more brigades of Heath and Artillery. Davis and Archer are close enough to close and engage, and uh, I think I will have them engage. So I will uh, I'll catch the action after I've moved the Confederates and closed for the battle. Okay, this is the situation at 8 a.m. after the Confederates have moved. Now I'm playing the Confederates very aggressively here just because I want to see how the combat works and uh, to see how the game works in general. So Davis and Archer have closed to primary. There will be combat here. These other two brigades are coming up very boldly in column right behind the main line. And of course the artillery limbered up is following. So the next phase is the defensive fire phase by the Union, then the offensive fire by the Confederates, and then a melee phase if I desire to do so. Let's catch the action after the Union have fired defensively first. Oh, I should point out that I'm going to use the combat-related tables that came with the Chickamauga game. They are official changes by the designer. Uh, this table is a bit less bloody than the original one, and uh, that's what I'm going to use. So we're going to have Davis fire, um, or rather Devon fire on Davis's brigade, and um, Gamble will fire on Archer. Let's see what they get. Okay, Davis's uh, combat value is 14, and that's the table he'll be firing at. He rolls, and he gets a 2, which is no result. Okay, Gamble will fire. He's on the 16 table, which is this one here. He rolls and gets, yo, a no result. Very bad results for the Union. Surprisingly bad luck. The Confederates will now fire offensively. Davis's brigade is on the 22 table, so he's going to do some damage, very likely. 22 table, yeah, with a 9. So the Confederates get incredibly good luck and the Union get incredibly bad luck. They do three hits on Davis, and if there had been a leader in the square, the leader would have had to check for a leader loss. So we have to mark that and uh, go from there. Okay, three hits on Davis, so 14 minus 3. We have to put an 11 counter on Davis. Now because he took casualties, he's got a roll for morale. Roll for morale. He doesn't want to get above seven. And he rolls at zero, so he's fine. Okay. Archer now fires 
on the 10 table. And I notice there's no advantage for being on higher ground here. That's curious, but that's the game. Okay, on the 10 table, rolls and he gets a six, which is one hit, one hit on gamble. So we have to get a 15 marker out. And um, we have to roll for morale because he took casualties. So we'll roll and he's okay. So that's the end of the fire phase. That was such a good um, fire phase for the Confederates. They almost want me to consider Mei Li, but I don't want to do that right now. I want to try to keep my casualties as low as possible. And since I got more or less a freebie with the Confederates, I won't Mei Li. So we're now going to do the 8 o'clock turn for the Union. And some new forces come in, Reynolds and part of the 1st Corps. And they come on the Emmitsburg Road way down here. And uh, we'll catch that action after the Union have moved. Okay, that's the situation after the Union have moved. I've moved Devlin and Gamble a bit back. They still need to buy time for Reynolds to come up, so um, they may have to take another hit from the Confederates here who are playing very aggressively and got very good luck. The Union uh, elements have moved up the 1st Corps artillery as fast as they can, and Reynolds and uh, the elements of the 1st Division are moving up the pike as fast as they can too. So uh, the Union are trying to buy time. Okay, this is the situation at 9 o'clock after the Confederates have moved. All the brigades are now in line, and they're coming on like a barroom brawler who won't go down. They got very good luck on the first um, battle there, so maybe they feel they can repeat it. As I mentioned in the other video, uh, artillery placement is very important, and it's very hard to get fields of fire in this game, and I'm for, all for that. The artillery works the way it's supposed to. I'm having trouble getting these artillery units into the battle. Anyway, I've got them up on the ridge here. This one's going to flank a little bit to the left. And we've got the two attacks going in here. Davis and Archer attack once again, Gamble and Devon. The Union will fire first defensively. Let's see what they get. The Union continues with its horrible luck, rolling a 3 on the 11 table, which is no result at all. Gamble fires on the 15 table. We'll see what they get. It almost makes me wonder if I'm doing something wrong. But the Union are getting such crappy rolls. Okay, 15. Makes me wonder about using the Gettysburg tables again instead of the Chickamauga. Anyway, uh, Gamble are firing on the 15 table. And they get a 4, which is not very good again. 15 table. Well, that's only a single hit on Archer. So we'll mark that and roll to see if Archer routes. Okay, so we put a 9 counter under Heath because he took a hit. And uh, we roll to see if he routes. Or rather passes morale. He rolls a 1, no problem there. So that's the casualties after the battle. The Confederates have taken only 1. The Union have taken 4. But, of course, we have to do the Confederate offensive fire. And uh, I'm sure this won't be very nice. Let's catch the action after they fired. Okay, Davis... Rolls a six, inflicting two more hits on uh, Devon. So we mark the two hits there. And we move the casualty marker on the chart up too. Confederates are just having fun destroying these Union cavalry. Heath will fire now on the nine table. Not too good. And of course he gets an eight. He gets a beautiful roll for that table. Eight is one more hit. So another hit on Gamble. Gamble being a 15, we switch him to a 14. And then we mark the casualties up again. So, the Confederates again are still doing very well in the fire combat. Um, I'm still a bit nervous about Mei Li. I don't feel like doing Mei Li. Archer's Brigade isn't very good. Um, why do Mei Li when I'm... The Confederates are doing so well anyway. So, uh, I want to keep... Confederate casualties low. So uh, that's the 9 o'clock turn for the Confederates. We'll now do the Union turn. Okay, this is the situation after the Union have moved. And um, that's for the 9 a.m. turn. Uh, we've got the 1st Corps elements infantry entering the town of Gettysburg now. Another division coming up the Emmitsburg Road, more artillery. And the 1st Corps artillery was able to get close enough, although they're still uh, limbered up. 
Devin and Gamble fell back again. This time they're on a slope terrain. And Tidball's battery is deployed and actually ready to fire. So we'll I'll actually have a situation where uh, we can do offensive fire for the first time. Because uh, defensive fire is only three for artillery. So um, Tidball could take a long range shot. And since it's free, he might as well. So Tidball will, Tidball will fire at Davis. We're talking four hexes away. And uh, what's the fire effect of that? Four effects is always basic. So he'd be firing on the nine table at Davis. Let's see if they can get some good luck with this shot. Nine table with Davis. Nine, they get an eight. Which means, yep, they take finally a hit on Davis at long range, which is about time. I'll mark that and we'll roll for morale. Okay, as you can see, the long range results for artillery are very subtle and slow. But Davis has taken a hit, marked that with a 21 counter, advanced the casualty marker, and he still must roll for morale because he's taken casualties. And a 3. What, um, I might point out that if he'd rolled a 9 or something, he'd be routed. So uh, long range artillery can do something, but you need the die rolls. So that's the end of the um, 9 a.m. turn for the Union. And uh, on to the 10 a.m. for the Confederates, where some more Confederates come in. Okay, this is the situation after the 10 o'clock turn. We have a huge assault going now. All of Heath's division is engaged. Tidball will be in primary. But um, hopefully some of these defensive fires by the Union will do something. Bacintosh and Garnet's artillery are whipping up the pike here. They're still in column. Hill, the Corps commander, is present. And, of course, these guys are still in command control within four. The Whitworth rifles have deployed, too and part of Pegram's artillery. So we might see some long-range artillery here too because they have a field of fire because these guys are on a ridge. Let's do defensive fire for the Union. Catch the action after all of the Union defensive fire. Okay, we had some interesting things happen that turn. The Union got average to poor luck again in the defensive fire, but they got good luck, or the Confederates got bad luck, on the morale results, Brockenborough took a couple of hits, but he routed. And Davis also took a hit and routed. So that's going to lessen these attacks quite a bit. Uh, Tidball's battery certainly helped, being 27 in defense. So they were almost guaranteed to hit uh, uh, Brockenborough. And uh, for them, it was fortunate that the Brockenborough routed. So it's the Confederate offensive fire now, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, the Confederates inflicted more casualties on Devon and Gamble, but uh, they did not rout. And I'd consider Mei again, or actually my first Mei but I tell you, Mei is so iffy. There's so many die rolls for morale where you could break. I don't think I want to chance it as yet. Even though the Confederates are heading casualties, uh, Union have had ten casualties, the Confederates have had six, so it's not they're not that far ahead. So I don't think I will... Um, melee again. Pegram, by the way, adding into Archer's attack gave them a very nice attack against Gamble. Gamble is now down to a 12. He took a few hits. So supporting artillery, when it's set up properly, can do some damage. The Whitworths here, I think there's a special rule for Whitworths at range 3, so I'll have to check that up. Okay, and that's the situation after the Confederates moved. The Union will move now for the 10 o'clock turn, and uh, the Union first course should be pretty well close to aiding Devon and Gamble right now because they're taking quite a pounding. I think they've gained the time they need. Let's, uh, let's see what the Union can do. I forgot one important phase here. I have to roll to see if these units rally. So let's roll for this one here. He rolls a four, so he does rally. And the other fella, he rolls a three, so these both rally. Hmm, that's lucky. Okay, Union will now move. Okay, this is after the Union have moved. And uh, I really don't like Devin and Gamble's position. I'd like to get them out. The first uh, division here of the first corps is up. They're in line, but... 
Union are just running out of space. They need to buy, I think, one more turn. So they're going to stay. That may be a mistake if the Confederates get lucky with their dice, but they're going to stay because they have to buy time for the Union First Corps to come up, which now means the Union or the Confederates are going to take their defensive artillery and inflict some more casualties on the Union, no doubt. Okay, this is after the Confederate defensive fire. The Union did pretty well. Maybe the luck does even out. The uh, Confederates got a couple of ro low rolls. They inflicted um, very little casualties, but enough to make Devon now flip to his uh, reduced side. So when you see these units that are white, it means that they're exactly half of their original strength. So Devon is pretty shot up. Gamble is not too bad, but at least they've held the pressure's ground for one more turn. So all that was um, the defensive Confederate fire. Um, now the Union can offensively fire. Let's see what they can inflict on the Confederates. Okay, the Union were able to get some beautiful defensive fire shots this time because Tidball's battery was tripled at that range and the first artillery was doubled. So they inflicted three hits on Archer, though he didn't route, and four hits on Pettigrew, and he didn't route. So a very uh, nice successful Union turn that time. And up to the rear, we have another division coming up, the uh, Emmitsburg Road, and elements of the First Corps passing through the town. So Devon and Gamble, though they're chewed up pretty bad, might have bought the precious time the Union needs to defend McPherson's and Seminary Ridge. So we'll be doing the 11 o'clock turn, and let's see what the Confederates can do. Okay, this is the situation for the noon turn after the Confederates have moved, but before the Union have taken their defensive fire. Heath is making one last push. His division is shot up pretty bad, but Devon and Gamble are weak also. So he's making one big push, although the Union defensive fire is going to be pretty nice. In the Confederate support, though, they've got lots of guns now deployed. Yes, long range, but they are going to be able to help in this attack. And that's Pender's division coming up the rear here. So this could be a very bloody turn with the Union firing perhaps a last time and getting some casualties. The Confederates firing back. Maybe I'll even consider May Lee this time. Uh, let's see how the Union defensive fire goes first. Okay, the Union got average results in their die rolls, but they did some fearful damage to Archer's brigade that is now cut in half and he's down to a three. So Archer's pretty well out of the picture now. They did inflict casualties on Pettigrew, but none of the Union or the Confederate arm um, routed. So the Confederates will now fire offensively and it won't be too nice because they've got lots of good gun support. Let's catch the action after the Union have taken their losses from the Confederates. Okay, that's the situation after the Confederates have fired and the Union took some very fearful casualties there. And I think now it might be time to consider May Lee. I'll just refresh myself on the rules to that because I know a lot of morale rules are involved. You have to do morale checks before you go in. But Devon here and Gamble have been bled pretty bad Gamble, not as much, but um, even then, these if, these mean these are iffy. Hmm. Well, I'll at least try to get Pettigrew in on Tidball here and Davis against um, Devon. So I'll see what the rules are for May Lee, and we'll follow the action. Okay, I'm almost inclined to take the free route option that's available to Devon because he's pretty messed up. The attacker has to do morale check, and there's always a chance that that will fail. Hmm. Big decisions. You know, I think Devin will take the voluntary route. I just like having units destroyed. So he's going to go back three. One, two, three. Take the voluntary route. And um, Davis is allowed to occupy the square, so that melee is over. I think it may be worth it. Now, Pettigrew is going to um, attack Tidball, but Tidball gets free defensive fire first, and that 8 is tripled, so he's firing on the 24 table defensively. He rolls a 3, and that initiates another hit on Pettigrew, which we mark. 
and reduce him to a 17. Because he's took a hit, he has to check morale. He may fail. He does not fail. So now we have our first melee, Pettigrew and Tidball. I'll have to check to see how that is done. Okay, well, you roll in the combat results table, but because we have an unlimbered piece here, Tidball, if uh, he fails morale, he'll be captured and knocked out. But um, let's catch the action after the melee results. Okay, checking the morale rules, um, Tidball inflicted casualties on Pettigrew and vice versa, but they both held. According to the rules, you keep going at it until one side breaks. So Tidball probably will lose this melee, but at least he'll go down fighting. We'll do another round, see what happens. Okay, as I suspected, the Confederates would win that melee. Pettigrew inflicted more losses on Tidball, but Tidball failed his morale check, and since he's unlimbered, he loses and is captured. So Pettigrew goes in, and that's the end of the um, noon turn for the Confederates. So the uh, Union will now move for the noon turn. And we've got some very close combats here. Okay, well it looks like the Cavalry did their job, but they're in a very bad way. That's uh, Buford's division. Uh, Gamble is still adjacent to many Confederates here. I've got to pull him out. But as you pull out, you have to take withdrawal fire. So I'm going to do that in the movement. We still have um, good old Devon here routed. But the first corps is up. It's going to be very iffy battle here. Um, it's very close. The Union just don't have a lot of room to maneuver. They've got another brigade coming up here, but um, let's follow the action after the Union have moved. Okay, that's the situation after the Union have moved. First Corps have come up into primary against uh, Davis and Pettigrew. They've deployed their artillery here. We'll have to rally uh, him. That's Devon. And elements of the 1st Corps and 11th are now coming up. So it's pretty dicey. It's the 11 o'clock turn. And the Confederates will take their defensive fire. And let's hope the Union can hold out. Okay, that's the situation after the um, 11 o'clock turn. Now the Union were able to rout Davis's brigade, which is good. Routing a unit in your turn is better because um, your opponent has to go through his whole turn because uh, routing, uh, rallying is only at the end of his turn. So he's taken that brigade out for an hour. They've stabilized their line, um, but the Confederates are still coming up in power. Now we'll try to rally this uh, cavalry brigade here, and he does. So the Union line is looking much better. Now I'm almost inclined to end the video there at 11 o'clock, which uh, actually I think it will. I'll call this video probably part one, and um, we'll see if I do a, a part two. The battle is getting interesting now, and I am enjoying it. We're almost at the height here. It's still a very interesting situation. But um, I'll end the video and we'll call this uh, part one. Thank you for watching.